Welcome. Welcome to South Point Church today. I just want to start off by saying, you know, sometimes the band does such a good job, I should just say amen, and we should just go ahead and head out and have coffee. Today was such a blessing to have them do that. Um, I also just want to say thank you for being here. I realize that there is almost no one else in the world that can, that can say that, that 150 people or 200 people will just give them an hour and 10 minutes of their day. So I want you to know that I see you being here as, as something that you've sacrificed your time for being here. And so we want to steward that. And I just really hope and pray that you take away something that makes your day better and makes your week better or maybe even just helps you out in life. So thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, I wanted to share that. We're in a series right now called Fight or Flight. This is the, the last week that we're in it. And just in case you don't know what the fight or flight response is, I've got two quick examples for you. So I'm going to give you an example of fight, okay? In the, a couple years ago, there were some videos going around on YouTube, and what was popular to do, and this was in the States because trick-or-treating and there's no gates or walls, is people would dress up as scarecrows and sit on their front porch. And then when kids would come up, they would jump up and yell or something and startle them. Now, I, I'm not a big fan of jump scaring. I, I don't think that that's a smart thing to do. But there was one video that, that circled around the internet of two guys, probably high school kids, walking up onto a porch, and this guy dressed as a scarecrow, pretending to be like a mannequin. He gets up and he says something, or he yells at him, and one of the guys just, just knocks him right in the face, just hits him in the nose and knocks him out. That's a great example of fight. That, that, that was him. He had an adverse situation come his way, and he decided to fight. Now, I'll give you an example of flight, and I'll use myself for this, and it also involves my wife, Casey. I am deathly afraid of these little murder hornets uh, that God created. I often ask, why would God create something that can fly like a helicopter but has a stinger on it? So I hate everything. I don't like bees. I don't believe in killing bees, but I, I don't like bees, yellow jackets, wasps all of those things, deathly afraid of them. And early in our marriage, there was a situation where there was a a yellow jacket or wasp or something in our house. And, you know, me being the the man of the house and, you know, chivalry and all that, I I threw my wife in front of myself as this thing (laughs) was buzzing around. And when I threw her in front, she got stung and she's super allergic. So that was, (laughs) so I, 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 fl- I was going to flee in that situation, and I did, and it worked for me, not for her, but for, but for me. So if we're looking at the story of a guy named Jacob, and Jacob's whole life was just consisted of, of fight or flight. And as we looked at him last week and we continue to look today, you're going to see a pattern in his life where he fights and then a pattern where he decides to flee. And so just to give you a quick background about Jacob, Jacob came from Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac and Rebekah came from Abraham. We all, most of us know who Abraham is. Abraham was the first one that God kind of set apart and said, I'm choosing you to work out this promise that I have for the entire world. So Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac gets married to Rebekah, and they have two kids. They have twins. The first one that comes out, is, a, is, a, is named Esau. Esau means red and hairy. So he came out red and hairy, so they named him literally a name that means red and hairy. The next one that comes out is Jacob, the star of, of, our, of our, what we're talking about today. And as Jacob came out, Jacob was holding on to the heel of Esau. And that's where he got his name, because what that meant... Is, is deceiver. It was like a slang term. It was meant like if you, if you came out, if someone would say, oh, that person, they, they, they pinched the heel of the one before them, or they hold on to the heel of the one before them. That's someone that's kind of tricky. That's someone that's a deceiver. So here Jacob is, is the deceiver. Esau is red and hairy. So I'm sure these are two very proud parents because they've got a hairy kid and then a deceiver. So as they grow up, Esau becomes the favorite because he's the firstborn. A firstborn gets priority. They're the ones, I'm a firstborn, so I feel like, you know, we're very special. And Esau has the priority. He has the birthright. He has the blessing. He has all these things. But before Jacob was born, Rebekah heard from an angel. And this angel told Rebekah, you're going to have two in your womb. And out of them are going to come two groups of people. And this is where it gets different. The older is going to serve the younger. Now, in those days, that just did not happen. 
And Rebecca, she kept this vision to herself. And so she and Jacob became deceivers. Jacob's whole life was, was centered around him and his mom trying to set him up to take the promise that God had given them. Now, they didn't need to do that to take this promise, but that's just what they did. Now, we, we looked at last week, Jacob does two very deceitful things. The first thing that he does is he catches his brother. Esau comes in. He's been out hunting. He's, he's, he's killed something. You know, he comes in. He's he probably, you know, got that kind of like manly swagger to him because he's just done that. And he's like, I'm starving. I'm famished. And Jacob happens to be cooking. And he says, give me some beans. And, and Jacob says, okay, I will, but I want your birthright. Now, that's like saying, I want your inheritance. I want your half of everything. So the way it worked is when Isaac died, Esau would get half of everything. And Jacob says, I want that. Now Esau gives it to him in, in trade for that bowl of beans. There's a whole other sermon about an Esau. You guys don't want to be Esau's in your life, but we're not going to talk about that. So Jacob, he, he could have just been nice and given his brother some food. But he, he was deceitful, so he took it so that he got that birthright. Now secondly, the only thing left that Jacob could take was he could take... Isaac's blessing. And so Isaac is old and he's blind and he can't see anything. And he says, my days are short. I want to bless my son. So he tells Esau, go out and I want you to kill food. And I want you to bring it back and cook my favorite stew. And when you cook it, feed it to me and I'm going to give you my blessing. So Rebekah hears of this. And Rebekah covers Esau or covers Jacob and Esau in fur because Esau was hairy. And Isaac's blind, or almost blind, so Rebekah covers him in, in, uh, in animal hair. And she makes him smell like Esau. And then she cooks food that Esau would have cooked. And she gives it to Jacob. You know, we have a saying, if it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So Esau, or, or Isaac, is in bed. And Jacob comes in. And to Isaac, it looks like a duck because you can't see. It sounds like a, or it, 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 it smells like a duck. It feels like a duck. And he actually says, everything about you tells me Esau, but you kind of sound like Jacob. But because he, he fooled him just enough, Isaac ends up giving Jacob the blessing. So now Jacob has stolen both the inheritance and the blessing. So because of that, Jacob has to flee. So he flees. Rebekah sends him to his brother's house, Laban, this guy named Laban. So he goes over to Laban's house and, and, and makes the trek, and he settles down there. And while he's there, he meets a woman, and she is, she's the one that he wants. He knows right up front, I, this lady is the one that I want. So Laban comes to him and says, you can't work for me for free. What can I do to pay you? And Jacob's like, I know exactly what you can do. You can give me Rachel. And Laban says, okay, cool, work for me for seven years. And then I'll give you Rachel. Okay, guys, how many of you would work seven years for your wife? Every hand better go up. <laughs> for those of you that I've just ruined Sunday lunch, I apologize. So Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, but Laban is a master deceiver. And so what Laban does is Laban tricks him. Jacob accidentally, I don't quite know how that happens. Someone smarter than me probably does, but Jacob accidentally marries and consecrates the marriage with Rachel's older sister, Leah. So he wakes up the next morning, rolls over, it's the wrong girl. So him and Laban have a discussion. And it settles where Laban says, okay, fine, fine, fine. Jacob, Leah is the firstborn. So she has to get married first. So then you've done it. Go ahead and finish the wedding week, and then I'll give you Rachel. So Jacob settles on that. He says, fine, I'll take Rachel. But he works another seven years. So he worked 14 years for Rachel. I would do 21 years for my wife. <laughs> She's shaking her head. I would like to come over to someone's house today for lunch after church. <laughs> so anyway, he works 14 years for these women. And then after that, he wants to build a flock. And so he works another six years for Laban. So all in all, Jacob has worked now almost 20 years for this man. And this man, Laban, there's this incredible uh, account of where Laban actually tricks Jacob. He's trying to steal his herd. And, and Jacob does this thing where he carves 
spots in these sticks and he puts it in front of the animals when they're mating. And so when they reproduce, they reproduce animals that have spots in them. Because Laban had said, well, you can have all the spotted animals and I'll keep all the pristine, clean animals. And Jacob's like, are you trying to deceive me? Well, I've got a trick up my sleeve. So what we have is two deceivers deceiving each other. And so it comes to a head where Jacob says, I don't feel safe here. And he takes his wives, he takes his family, takes everything he has, and he flees. He says, we're going back to Canaan. Canaan's the land that he originally came from. That's where this dude Esau is waiting to kill him. Because when Esau found that he lost his blessing, he said, I'm not going to kill you now because dad's alive. As soon as dad's dead, you're dead. And so that's why he left. But he says, I'm going to go back to Canaan. I'm going to take my family back to Canaan. And three days later, Laban realizes that they're gone. And so Laban goes and pursues him. And the two of them, they have an encounter on a hillside. And in that encounter, there's a lot of bickering. There's a lot of talking. But what happens is Jacob stands up to Laban. He says, I'm fighting for what's right. He puffs his chest out and he says, you've done me wrong. I've worked for you 20 years. You've changed my wages 10 times. You've done me wrong. And the two of them go back and forth, and they end up coming up with a peace treaty. They build a, a, a stone pillar, and they, Laban says, I'll stay here. Jacob says, I'll stay there, and the two of them part ways. Now, that's where we come to where we're going to pick up the story today. This incredible thing starts to happen to Jacob. Remember, he has gone his whole life deceiving. He's gone his whole life fighting or fleeing. And so now we pick up in Genesis 32. The majority of where we are today is Genesis 32. And, and I'm going to read, and you guys can follow along in the screen. But the first verse in Genesis 32 says, Jacob also went on his way. So this is when Jacob, Laban's gone his way. Jacob's gone his way. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Verse 2, when Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahaniam. Now what that means is double camp. So let me break this down for you because this is more incredible than you know or you can understand. Jacob has left his camp. He sees that this was a double camp, meaning he's camping and something else is camping. And in the verse it says that the angels appeared to him. So he sees that there are two camps, his and there's a camp of angels. Jacob has his eyes opened, and he sees that there are angels that were encamped around him, protecting him. Now, there's another story in the Bible that explains this, that shows you the power of what Jacob saw, and that's in 2 Kings, and we're going to put it on the screen for you here. And it, it says this. It says in verse 6, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out, so this, this is a different story, different characters. This is Elisha. Elisha was a prophet. So this is Elisha and his servant. So when his servant goes out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. And so the servant to Elisha says, Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. So he's, he's we're toast, we're done. City's surrounded. And so the next verse don't be afraid, the prophet answered. So Elisha says, don't stress, it's chill. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prays a prayer. And he says, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. The servant's eyes are opened, and look at what he sees. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike this army with blindness. And they would go on to do that. God would strike them with blindness. This is what Jacob saw. Jacob saw an army of, of, of fiery chariots, of horses, of angels that were around him, that were protecting him. Jacob has this incredible experience. And he walks off that hill and he says, wow, I had God's army behind me. Now, you would think that this would sort Jacob, that his faith would be sorted and everything would be okay, but there's still a lot of flight left in Jacob. He's still not confident in the fight that he could do with God behind him. So we turn back to Genesis, and we pick up in verse 3. So remember, Jacob is sending, he's going back towards Canaan. And what's in Canaan? Esau. What does Esau want to do? 
murder him. See, when Jacob left, his mom, Rebekah, said, you stay with Laban, and I'll tell you when Esau has calmed down. Well, Rebekah never tells Jacob that. So Jacob is coming, and in fact, he would never see his mom again, but he's coming, and he doesn't know what's up with Esau. He just knows, I'm walking into a land where this dude wants to kill me. And so what he does is Jacob, he sends messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. You know what Seir and Edom means? Hairy and red. It's like Esau couldn't get away from this nickname. Everything around his life was hairy and red. So anyway, it goes on in verse 4. He instructed them, This is what you were to say to my lord Esau, your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle, I have donkeys, I have sheep, I have goats, I have male and female servants. Now I'm sending this message to my lord that I may find favor in your eyes. Jacob is humbling himself. He's taking a posture of humility. He's saying, my lord, I want to find favor. You know what the other thing that Jacob's doing? Jacob's giving Esau an inventory list. Why is he doing that? Because Jacob wants Esau to know, hey man, I know I took two really important things from you, but I have all my own stuff now. Like, I'm sorted. Like, I'm not going to take anything from you. I've got got family, I've got servants, I've got donkey, I've got cattle. Like, I'm totally good. I just want to come in and hopefully we can reconcile things and I can find favor in your eyes. And so what happens next is that, is that Jacob's messenger comes back to him. And his messenger says, Jacob, guess what we did? We saw Esau. We told him the stuff that you said. But Esau is coming and he has 400 men that he's bringing with him. Now, this is a stressful moment for Jacob. Because Jacob knows that an, a, a group of 400 men means an army. It means that Esau's prepared for battle. So Jacob knows the story of Grandpa Abraham going to battle with 318 men. And with 318 men, Abraham took down four different kings with those 318 men. And so Jacob's like, this guy's got 400. That's a higher number than 318. And I'm not four kings. I'm just one dude with a family. I'm toast. And so Jacob utters a statement. And and. This statement comes in great fear and distress. And in fact, the scripture actually says in the next, in in verse 6, it says, When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he's coming to meet you with 400 men. Verse 7, the next verse, In great fear and distress, Jacob divided. So Jacob has a plan that he's going to try and preserve his family. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think that Jacob stood up to Laban? He puffed his chest out and he stood up to him and said, You're not taking what's mine, I'm fighting. But when it came to Esau, why was Jacob terrified? This is the same guy that looked up and saw an encampment of angels around him. It's the same guy that saw chariots of fire protecting him. It's the same guy that's been with him, that gave him a promise. It's it's the same guy that knows that God is with him. And yet, he's terrified with great fear and distress. You know why? Because with Laban, Jacob was in the right. He knew he was right. He'd been done wrong. But with Esau, Jacob knew that he was the one that was in the wrong. See, what happens is, a lot of our past prevents us from moving into the victory that God has for us in the future. We carry guilt. We carry, uh, we carry shame. But we also have this thing in us, or most of us do, that's a conscious that tells us, like, you were wrong. You did something wrong. And so Jacob knows, I've got no foot to stand on here. There's nothing that I can do because I have done this guy so wrong. So Jacob is terrified. He comes up with a plan. He says, I'm going to divide my camp. So he splits them in half, and he figures... Esau's going to at least get 50% of them. He's going to kill them. And I'll go with the one that's the side that's fleeing. So at most, I lose 50%. So he had two wives, one that he liked more than the other. I'm sure he just split it right down the middle. And that's what Jacob did. But Jacob's fear was not right. In fact, Jacob's fear was wrong. And here's why Jacob's fear was wrong. I want you to, I want you to see this 
And I want you to see if this applies to you in your life. Jacob's fear was wrong because it followed after a great deliverance. Okay, how many of us have been delivered by something? And by deliverance, it means you, you got something that you didn't think was going to happen. You, you, you were given something, you were given that, you got cancer, but you were cured of cancer. Or the car didn't start on, on Friday, but it started on Monday. Or whatever it is in your life, something, you've had this thing that just, oh, this release is, oh my goodness, I thought this was going to happen, and it, it didn't. Instead, I got this. Casey and I experienced this. Casey, long ago, was given a valid visa to be in South Africa, and somewhere along the lines, there was some things that happened in home affairs, maybe a little bit of corruption, and we were in Swaziland, and we found out that we were not allowed to enter South Africa because Casey's visa was now fake. And so we spent almost seven years, seven years, right? Almost seven years fighting against home affairs. We took them to court. We worked with lawyers. One lawyer was arrested. Then we went to another lawyer, you know? We actually thought the one, yeah, I'm not going to go down that road. <laughs> so, but, but we, we were every day desperately praying for deliverance. And then finally one day, the word came back, and Casey was removed from the ban list. We had won the case, and we, we won home affairs. There's only one person in the country that can make that decision. That's the minister of home affairs. So God gave us deliverance from a situation. Now, post that situation, how many times do I find myself fearful? A ton. How many times do you find yourself fearful after being delivered by something? So another reason why his fear was wrong, because he had just had a divine visitation. Jacob just had angels visiting around him. He just saw God. How many of you, if you saw God, if you saw an army of angels, that you would just say, you know what, the rest of my life I'm afraid of nothing. But then as soon as a spider crawls across your floor, I bet you're on the countertop. So Jacob had a divine visitation, and he's still terrified. And then the last reason is it arose out of his old sins. Our old sins keep us from walking in the victory that God has for our future. Our old sins, they create cruft. It creates this, this tension in us that says, I'm not worthy. Jacob knew that he was so wrong in what he did to Esau. That even though he saw God move in these incredible ways, he said, nothing that God has done can be stronger than the guilt that I carry because I know that what I did was more wrong than what God's trying to set me free from. We don't want that to carry through our lives. I don't want you guys to carry that. Is there a place in your life where you can let go of some old sins? You can let go of some old mistakes and ask God, what's, what's the victory instead that you've promised that I'm going to walk in? Now, out of this, something good comes out of this. Jacob prays this, this desperately humble prayer. Jacob is on the last, his last leg. And he goes through and he prays this prayer where he is just face down to God. And he says, God, I humble myself. And Lord, remember you called me and, and you spoke to me. And you said that you're going to make a great nation out of me. And I come from Abraham. And do you remember the promise you gave to my grandfather and the promise you gave to my father? And please don't let me die. God, please. Jacob prays this incredibly humble prayer. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he starts out and he says, Oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. Jacob's like, but didn't you tell me to go back? I mean, Jacob's praying this desperate, desperate prayer. He says, I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I'm unworthy. So Jacob's humbled himself. Now watch what happens with God. You take three bad things that come from Jacob's fear. You add one humble prayer. And out of it, you're going to get three good things that come because Jacob's fear. See, God takes all the bad. And when you interject him into it, it doesn't matter what it is. But he produces good from it. And so the three things that we have that come from, from Jacob being driven to prayer are Jacob's fear. It led him to prayer. It led him to talk to his heavenly father. It led him to talk to God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is just talking to God. Jacob, he, he was like, God, we got to chat. 
Because I don't see any other way out of this. It also led him to take a review of his life. Jacob thought back, who am I? Who did you call me to be? We talked about words to live by at the beginning of the year. Who are you? Who did God say that you are? Sometimes we have to pause and we have to take stock of who we are. We have to remind ourselves, this is who God says that I am. I come from Isaac. Isaac comes from Abraham. God has given me a promise. God has made me part of the blessing to the world. I come from that. See, you guys don't have the promise of Abraham. Instead, what you guys have is you have the promise of Jesus. Is that Jesus died for you. He gave his life for you. He gave you freedom. He pours grace out onto you. Jesus' love is unlimited. It's unlimited. It's limitless, and it's for you. And sometimes you have to go back and you got to take stock of your life and you got to say, you know what, I'm not those things that I did wrong. I'm not those things where I messed up. I am someone that God gave his son for. Therefore, I am loved. And sometimes it's our fear that drives us to that place. But let it drive you to God. And when you seek God, God reminds you who you are. And the last thing is, and we sort of touched on it, is it led Jacob to seek God's promises. And so Jacob has this encounter. And then Jacob goes on in the scripture and the story. And I'll read a, just a couple verses, and, and they're not on the screen. You can kind of follow along. Jacob spends the night in this place where he's just prayed this prayer. And then from there, he has this idea. He says, you know what? He selected a gift for his brother Esau. So he says, I'm going to send gifts to Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, male donkeys. He put them in care of his servants, each herd by itself, and he sent his servants to Esau and he gave them instructions. So here's what Jacob did. Jacob, he, he, he takes out of all of his possessions... And he says, okay, I'm going to take these animals, and then these animals, and then these animals, and then these. And they're going to go on a line. And each one is going to hit Esau in increments. So Esau is going to be overwhelmed by by blessing from Jacob. Can we just pause and say, did Jacob, when is Jacob going to understand that he doesn't have to do all this because he has God on his side? See, Jacob's still trying to manipulate the situation. He's still trying to flee from Trusting God with his life. And so, uh, uh, something that I thought about that we can apply to ourselves is this. Jacob said, I can surrender my goats, I can surrender my sheep, I can surrender my camels, but I'm not going to surrender myself. And so the question for you is that. What, what is it that you would say, you know what, I'll surrender my goats, I'll surrender my sheep, I'll surrender my camels for this situation, I'll surrender my possessions, I'll surrender the things that, that I've built or I've accumulated as long as I don't have to surrender myself. Now Jacob would go on after this, he would go on to actually manipulate the situation even more where he would strategically stack his family so that he... And Rachel and Joseph, his beloved son, were at the back. And he would send everyone else in front of him. Now, a man that has surrendered himself to God is a man that puts himself at the front of the line, not at the back of the line. And so, in your life, what I really hope that you look at is, if I'm trusting God, or if I'm trusting whatever... Whatever it is that you're putting your trust in, your faith in, are you at the front of the line or are you at the back of the line? Are you taking all the things, are you operating out of this this idea of maybe guilt or shame where you're saying, you know what, I was so wrong, so let me just, let me overcompensate. Let me send my money. Let me surrender my kids. Let, Let me donate this to this charity. Let me do these things so that these, I don't have to be at the front of the line. So Jacob, then we come to what is my favorite moment in this, in this whole story. So if you've checked out, if your email box is clean, if you've gone through your messages, you can check back in for this part here. What happens next is Jacob has a fight with an unlikely person. And Jacob has a fight with somebody that we would never think that he would fight with. And the person that Jacob has a fight with is God himself. 
And it starts out with this. It says, a man wrestled with him. So in verse 22, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. And finally, Jacob is left alone, comma, in his tent. And then a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So what I want you to take away from that is Jacob did not wrestle with a man. A man wrestled with Jacob. What this means is that it was this man that was in control of this fight with Jacob. Jacob never had control of this fight. Jacob would go on to wrestle this man all night long. They would struggle together. But it's important to know that there was no moment where Jacob was in control of this. This man came in and he wrestled Jacob. And then it goes on to say... In verse 24, so Jacob, or in verse 25, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled the man. So finally, this man, who we would learn later is actually God in human form, he touched Jacob's hip. He says he realizes that he, this, is not, it's, this fight isn't going to be over. This man did not touch Jacob's hip because Jacob was about to win the fight. This man touched Jacob's hip because he intimately knew Jacob because he created Jacob. He created all of us. God intimately knows you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knew you in the womb before you were even a a, a thought in your parents' mind. God knew who you were. And with that, he intimately knew Jacob so well that he knew that he could end this. All he had to do was just tap a hip. And when he tapped his hip, Jacob's position changed. And instead of fighting the man, he started hanging on to the man. Because Jacob could no longer lean on his own power. He could no longer fight. He could no longer flee. The guy was stuck. And when he's stuck, he holds on. He changes his grip. And he holds on to this man. And he goes on to say, Then the man said, so not Jacob, but then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. So that's God is saying, this is done, bro. This is over. This whole thing that you've been doing all night, it ends right now. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob was now desperate. He's completely desperate for that blessing. Why was Jacob desperate for the blessing? Because he spent his entire life searching after and pursuing and manipulating and fighting and fleeing from every situation so that he could step into what his mom Rebecca told him this blessing would be. Jacob has fought for it. He's been desperate for it. And finally, in this moment, wrestling with this man, he's been disarmed. He can do nothing. No more fighting, no more fleeing. Come on, how many times do we see ourselves in that situation? Face down on the floor, looking at bills that we can't pay, looking at two broken down cars, looking at a roof, a a leak in a roof, laying in bed last night with it being, you know, as hot as it was and worried about your kids because they're in a room that's boiling hot. If you open the windows, you get mosquitoes, whatever. Jacob is done. He's done. He's at the end of his rope and all he can do is hang on. He can't even stand up and he hangs on and he says, bless me, please. I'm desperate. If you don't bless me in this moment, I'm done because I got nothing left. Guys, hang on to your blessing. Hang on to God. If you feel like your feet have been swiped out from under you, if you feel like your hip has been taken away from you, if you feel like the promise that you've been given is nowhere in sight, you are in the perfect place to hang on to God. And when you do, His blessing will come. All Jacob had to do is surrender and hang on to God, and it happened. And the way it happened is so remarkable. This man, this God, he looks down and he says, what is your name? Jacob, my name is Jacob. And the man says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. What happens when you rename something, you take possession over it. When you rename something, you change its trajectory. When you rename something, you change its reference point. So the deceiver becomes the nation of Israel. 
which means strives with God, struggles with God. God said, I know that you're going to struggle with me for the rest of eternity. I'm calling it right now. I know this fight's not over, but I'm taking you away. You're no longer a deceiver. Instead, you're my chosen Israel who I will love no matter what you do. And no matter how much you strive with me, I'm naming you because you're mine and because I will give everything for you to bring you back to me. And the story ends with Jacob asking this man, he says, what's your name? And the man, he says, I'm not, he doesn't tell him his name. He actually says, please tell me your name. But he replied, so the, so the man, God replies, why do you ask my name? It's like God said, you know who I am. I don't have to tell you. You know I'm God. You know you've been wrestling with me. And so then, finally, he blessed him. And so Jacob called that place Peniel, which, which it means to, to wrestle with God and, or to see God face to face and to, and to live through it. And then this beautiful verse ends with this in verse 31. So imagine this fight has happened. In verse 31, the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, this place where he was, and he was limping because of his hip.